IBM for many, many years. Uh, he's a professor of computer science at Buenos Aires. I first heard of him when I was a graduate student at MIT working on, a, on my thesis, and I heard about his undergraduate at New York University that were publishing papers faster than I was. And, uh, found that what he was working on was just one book. Uh, you may have heard of him in uh, a number of ways. Uh, he worked on the RISC 6000 computer, that's the IBM computer, the first RISC machine. He worked with John Cock. Uh, he was in charge of uh, the optimizing compiler, and it was his idea to use graph coloring uh, in order to do register allocation. One, one of the wonderful applications of graph coloring uh, in computer science. I never actually heard Greg talk, so, uh, but I did hear his thesis advisor, Jack Schwartz, uh, describe his talk. It was a time, Greg, when you were in Buenos Aires, and you could not come to uh, the States to give a talk on your stuff. So Jack Schwartz uh, gave a talk on it, and uh, he started, and it was uh, unbelievably wonderful. He started off by saying, you know, I view mathematics kind of flashlight, which you shine on something where that you're interested in, and it gives you lots of information about that stuff. And uh, what Greg has done is to show that there are some, some, some problems in mathematics, some problems in mathematics can give you no information about. This was before there were black holes. He was talking about there are black holes. You shine your flashlight, and nothing is reflected back. And, uh, in fact, uh, Greg has given some very beautiful problems of this kind. If you want to show that a Turing machine is the smallest Turing machine to, to compute something, then that's a problem that uh, you cannot you cannot uh, you cannot prove that a Turing machine is the smallest Turing machine to compute something. Uh, maybe even, uh, a few trivial examples, but aside from a few trivial trivial examples, you can't do that. And maybe uh, so that's another way in which. Uh, another way in which you may have heard of uh, Chaitin is uh, in Kamagar of Chaitin complexity. Uh, you know, I can put up uh, two numbers like that. And I can put up one. And I could ask you, uh, which of these is random? Or which of these is more random? And, uh, you know, if you ask the probability theory, which of these two numbers is more random, they'll say, uh, you know, how did you generate them? I, I, I say one of them was generated by the cost of a die. One of them was generated by the, these were generated by the cost, costing a 10-sided die. Which one do you think was generated by costing a 10-sided die? So uh, you, you'll all look at it and say, well, surely it's that number, uh, not this one. This one doesn't look random at all. Uh, but how, so probability theory, how can you talk about uh, this number being less random than that number? And uh, one wonderful thing about Palmer Bar chain complexity is it enables you to say that, look, oh, there's a short program for generating the second number, so it's not random. There's a way to talk about a particular number and say that it's not random. So it's very full of ideas, and uh, I'll let you uh, thanks very much, Manuel. Um, great pleasure to be here. Um, you know, we're in a state of euphoria now in the computer business and um, because things are going so well, right? Uh, the web, uh, e-commerce, uh, it's all paying for our salaries and it's, uh, it's a nice moment to be around when things are going so well. Um, but I'd like to talk, I'd like to, I'd like to make the outrageous claim that has a little bit of truth, that actually all of this is due, um, that all of this, um, things that's happening now with the computer taking over the world, the digitalization of our society, of, uh, of information in, in human society, you could say in a way is the result of a philosophical question that was raised by uh, David Hilbert at the beginning of the century, um, and and 
So I'm going to say that in, it's not a complete exaggeration. It's not a complete lie to say that Turing invented the computer in order to shed light on a philosophical question about the foundations of mathematics that was asked by Hilbert. And in a funny way, that led to the creation of the computer business. So it's not completely true, but there is some truth in it. You know, most historical statements are a lie, so this one isn't that much worse than most others. So, 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 um, so, so I'd like to, like to explain the philosophical history of the, of the computer. So in a way, what happened, and I'll tell you more, is that, that, um, that, um, Hilbert said we should formalize all of mathematics and, and mathematical reasoning. And this, this failed, because to Gödel and Turing showed that it couldn't be done. But in fact, in another funny, it failed in that precise technical way, meaning. But in fact, it succeeded magnificently because formalization of reasoning, no, but formalization of algorithms has been the great technological success of our time, pro computer programming languages, right? So, so, so you might say that, so if you look back at the history of the beginning of this century, you'll see papers by logicians studying the foundations of mathematics in which they had programming languages. Now you look back and you say, this is clearly a programming language. If you look at Turing's paper, of course, there's a machine language. But if you look at uh, papers by Alonzo Church, you see the Lambda Calculus, which is a functional programming language. If you look at Gödel's original paper, you see what to me looks like Lisp. It's very close to Lisp. You know, the paper begs to be rewritten in Lisp. So, so, so in a funny way, this, 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 so I'd like to give you this sort of hidden philosophical history of computer technology, which is how philosophically minded mathematicians set out to solve once and for all the foundational problems of mathematics and did not succeed, but helped to create computer technology as a byproduct. This was the failure of this project. We're all benefiting from the failure, the glorious failure of this project. However, this project has not completely died. You might think it's, um, I'm going to start more systematically from the beginning, but I'm trying to give an introduction. Um, it's, it's, popular, it's, it's popular to think, well, Gettle did this thing in 1930 and, and, and Turing added a lot of precise, uh, profound stuff in 36. And and it's all very wonderful, but the world has moved on from that point. And what I'd like to do is to tell you that, in fact, um, there has been some, I've done some more work in this area. Um, you may think it's misguided. Uh, most of the world has shrugged and gone on saying, we have to, go, we have this bit of disappointment. What Gettle and Turing showed is that mathematics, axiomatic formal reasoning has certain limitations. You can't formalize it all. And, and at first people were tremendously shocked, and then they sort of shrugged and said, so what? Mathemat mathematicians went on ignoring this. And um, uh, my misfortune or fortune was that, that I didn't want to shrug. I said, I want to I wanna understand this better. And I'm going to tell you the story of my attempt to understand Gödel in completeness. Okay? Instead of... Instead of uh, so it's a psychological problem that a good psychiatrist could have cured me of, and then I wouldn't have done any of this work. So let me start at the beginning and tell you a little bit this story of a hundred of years of, 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 of intense worry, crisis, self-doubt, and self-examination and angst about the philosophy of mathematics. Um, there have been lots of crises in the history of mathematics. Mathematics is not placid, static, and eternal. 